Every once in a while, there'll be a lawyer who commits suicide. And that gets the attention of the entire profession. But if you take small steps back from that, then you see people who aren't sleeping, can't perform as effectively as they used to, then as a lawyer, I would suggest they not assume the person's not committed, they not assume the person's not as smart as what they thought, but that they realize that perhaps if the person hasn't taken any vacation time in four years, which many lawyers don't, then they might see that the bottom line is impaired precisely because no one's focusing on, and I'll use the generic term, wellness. Welcome to the Inside Forbes Council's podcast. Each episode shares transformative insights and advice from members of Forbes Councils, a group of invitation-only communities for successful executives and entrepreneurs. This is Inside Forbes Councils. Hey everyone, this is Stephen Ganoza. Welcome to Inside Forbes Councils. Today, we have my interview with Kathy Morris. Kathy is the founder of Under Advisement and a member of the Forbes Coaches Council. She'll share her experience in helping firms rethink how they develop their staff through learning and development programs and provide a better, healthier workplace. So, Kathy, thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. Before we get into it, let's just have you uh, introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do. My name is Kathy Morris. I run a career counseling for lawyers practice called Under Advisement. And I have been doing that for many, many years. And prior to that was a practicing attorney. I live in Chicago, but my practice is national. And I am thrilled to be part of the council and talking to you today. So tell me a little bit about that transition. Like, like what made you stop being a practicing lawyer and, and go start under advisement? What was the catalyst for that? So I started teaching law school at Northwestern Law School in Chicago, and they asked me to run the, what they called at that time, the placement office. I think now it's called career strategies office. And I really didn't see why I would do that, but I really did a favor, Steve. More than anything, I did a favor for someone. I said I would do that for a year. And during that year, I realized several things that were pertinent to my career going forward. And primarily, it was that lawyers need the career counseling, not just law students. It's lawyers, the alumni who come back in, they have the context, they have the desire to really make a better choice next. And that motivated me to want to go into private practice to advise them. For lawyers, is it typical that there's a lack of development or whatnot after you get out of law school? Is like, you know, you get your degree, you're a lawyer, great, now you're, now you're just on your own? Is that how it's structured? It depends where you work, clearly. But one of the other things I noticed at Northwestern was that lawyers were coming back in as alums telling me that they picked their law firm because they just thought they would get good training there, but that there was no training. And I felt that was another wrong that needed to be addressed. And so I became one of the pioneers in lawyer training and professional development at that time. And now there's much more in the way of programming and interaction for lawyers who want to learn. And definitely the bar associations play a good part in helping lawyers continue to progress and develop. And as well, as you might know, like other professions, we have requirements that we get a certain number of credits annually. And so again, lawyers can look to providers and places to learn. And so I would say now it's not as much a sink or swim profession as it used to be. And that's a wonderful thing for the clients as well as for the lawyers. So what are some of the skills or traits or or whatnot that you help lawyers develop? It is across the board from law students to new lawyers to parents who've been out of the workplace and want to come back in to partners, to people who want to retire and want an encore. So the skills can be anything from as basic as being a better legal writer to knowing how to argue and negotiate better, to knowing how to develop business, and to understanding how to be creative in your career by 
finding solutions that aren't cookie cutter, that aren't just the same old, that really bring clients value and to help lawyers, et cetera, also be creative to move forward in their career in an unbounded way. So lawyers and creativity, those, those are words that often don't wind up in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know. Maybe you're talking to the different people than I am, but I do know that the lawyers do very much live in the world of thought and like to develop ideas and like to problem solve and would want to be more creative if they didn't let some traditional barriers hold them back. Okay, so let, let's take a step back here and just like define creativity, right? Like, so like in this context, what does it mean to be a creative leader? In this context, I think it means having new and valuable ideas that you can act on and that you can share with others, that you can write about, that you can speak about, and that you can implement. Well, let me give you an example in the world of lawyer professional development, since we were talking about that. I think all too often, the people in those jobs, and they're mostly lawyers, are concerned about the status quo, preserving their reputation and their work, their job, so that they do things that are safe, so that they do things that are common, writing programs, litigation programs, programs that really have tried and true. And there's nothing wrong with building a foundation and making it institutionalized. But when they do that to the exclusion of creating new programs, finding new presenters, thinking of new ways to, so to speak, market and reach out to the lawyers so that they'll be drawn to the programming, then I think they are moving into the area of needing to be more creative and needing to come up with their own ideas or ideas from other walks. And I'll give you an example. Lawyers, if you know, are not often, even the most sophisticated lawyers, are not often financially literate. We didn't go become accountants. We don't like math. We don't think we're good with numbers. We don't know how to read financial documents. We don't even want to get near creating spreadsheets. I mean, we're just holding back from that. And yet our clients often need assistance that has to do with numbers and finance and decision-making that's sophisticated in crises. If we thought about offering financial literacy curricula for lawyers, if we could think about going to find a forensic accountant who has both dealt with law and finance to present, if we could bring the value of this in the, so to speak, marketing of the program to the lawyers so that they would realize that they do need this, though they don't know that they do to that point or haven't had those kinds of brushes with class and courses, then I think we're doing something that's creative, that takes a step forward, that is not the common solving of the common problem, but that helps lawyers do more, be better, and in fact, be more creative to, in finding solutions for their clients. Does that make sense, Steve? I think it makes sense from the learning and development side about it, how somebody in learning and development can be more creative about the continuing education that's offered to lawyers. Okay. What about the lawyers themselves? Is there an example of creativity there you could share? Yes, absolutely. The legal profession is slow to some of the things that you might think are traditional. One of the areas that's emerging that is kind of scaring lawyers, but is a deeply seated business issue as well as a personal issue, is wellness. It's looking into the science, it's looking into the learning that will help lawyers avoid the burnout, avoid the confusion, avoid the kind of things you might think about lawyers, the anxiety and the anger and the things that really propel them to problems in their lives, and learn how to get input and as a leader learn how to give that kind of not only information to other lawyers but to create cultures that sustain the creativity and the wellness so that the bottom line is improved clearly as a byproduct but so that the humans in the organization are more productive and more satisfied does that broaden it a bit for you that opens up a whole new can of worms, uh, yeah. culture. You know, I could be a lawyer. I could think that wellness is important. But if I'm in uh, a firm where, you know, uh, I'm going to get fired or like I'll have no chance of making partner at the firm if I'm not working, 
you know, 18 hours a day, right? Like how, how, how do you affect change in those organizations? Um, or, or, you know, do you, do you value something like wellness at the expense of your career? Well, it's interesting because if you avoid the issues of wellness, you may be dooming your career without knowing it. However, it takes a lot of courage to be sort of on that leading edge uh, to a new idea like that, like that for lawyers that's not cerebral in the sense of uh, problem solving, but that is a humanistic sort of a need. And I think information is power and information is valuable to lawyers. And so if it were me that were trying to affect change in an legal organization and trying to convince the leaders at the top to open their culture to more focus on the value and the wellness of their lawyers, I would bring them literature, business literature. I would bring them scientific literature, though not though something that was three pages, not a, an academic work. And to show them that, for example, the Energy Project will tell them that if lawyers, if anyone works in spurts of more than 90 minutes, they're going to become unproductive. They're going to wane in their energy. They're going to get headaches. They're going to be less able to build that next six minutes efficiently than if they took a break. And a break can mean walking down the hall. It can mean going to get a cup of something that's not going to again, uh, dehydrate them and debilitate them. So it doesn't have to be that I'm saying that lawyers need to work less. I'm saying that lawyers need to work better. And to do that is the pulsing of uh, work and renewing the energy for that work. And there's lots of science about that. So that we feel guilty as lawyers taking breaks, but what we as leaders should feel guilty about is overworking our people such that they cannot sustain their jobs over a period of time. No one wants that. As I understand it, law firms usually work in terms of billable hours. So how does this make business sense for a leader to be like, okay, yeah, you know, work 90, take 20 off or, or whatever it is, right? Well, I didn't say 20, but I, I, <laughs> I hear you. And I don't think science says it has to be, you know, a set amount. Every once in a while, there'll be a lawyer who commits suicide. And that gets the attention of the entire profession periodically and temporarily. But if you take small steps back from that, then you see people who aren't sleeping, who aren't able to communicate well in a meeting because they're distracted. If you just look at their fingernails, you might know. And if you see that people can't any longer perform as effectively as they used to, then as a lawyer, I would suggest they not assume the person's not committed. They not assume the person's not as smart as what they thought, but that they realize that perhaps if the person hasn't taken any vacation time in four years, which many lawyers don't, if the person has not served on any community committees to add value and, and diversity to their lives, then they might see that the bottom line is impaired precisely because no one's focusing on, and I'll use the generic term, wellness or culture that would allow that. You know, Steve, there's also literature about the role of fun, the role of creative thinking, the role of thinking small to think big. This doesn't have to be global. This hasn't, doesn't have to mean that they have to put sleeping pods in their workplace the way some of the modern companies do. doesn't mean that. It just need, means that the leaders need to be more informed and more intelligent. And they definitely want to be those things. Yeah, it's an interesting point you bring up under other industries because we, we see this particularly in uh, like investment banking now, right? Like you don't have to wear a suit to the office. We have a gym in the office and all this. Is that the right approach? Uh, yes. So that is, those are some of the right approaches. I mean, there are many of them. And I think for the most part, for lawyers, you know, some of those perks have been proven helpful, allowing sabbaticals periodically that people can earn and that people can buy for, right? There are a lot of interesting, cool things a company or a law firm can do, but also there are some micro moments that can be important. And part of it is if lawyers realize they're not being inclusive, for example, and I'm switching gears a bit here, but if they get in the elevator to down to lunch, 
Um, and they don't say hello to anyone but one lawyer in the elevator who's just like them in every way. If they don't, if they say, how'd you like the game last night? But they, they're only talking to one person who's like them. They're not ever thinking of having that kind of inclusive conversation that takes no time, but that shows that you really see that someone is there for you, that's who's working for you. Then, then they are impairing a culture and people's well-being because how else is that lawyer going to get the attention of the leader other than working, working, working? Right. And so, again, I'm showing you that there are a lot of different ways and it doesn't have to be spending money or putting in a gym or, 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 or any of the larger kind of perks. Those, you know, those are great. It can be in the small moments if you're really focused on what you're trying to accomplish for people. And part of that is recognition and valuing the fact that they have chosen to work with you and for you and for your clients. And seeing that they are there in the small moments, not just in the weekend when you can assign them something that, you know, they have to give up a wedding, not their wedding, hopefully, but a wedding, you know, to be in the office to do that work. You follow what I'm saying there? I do. I go back to the viewpoint of the lawyer or the employee, the supported in this relationship of being like powerless in this. Like now you're kind of at the mercy of your manager or your partner, like realizing that this stuff is important. And you said that you can bring information to them. You can try to educate them on the value of these sort of things. Is there any other recourse for somebody who might be burned out and, you know, and, and, and like what's, what's happening now is just not working? Right. Well, you don't have to do it all yourself. To, one of the basic avenues for recourse is to find a mentor, whether it's within your workplace or beyond your workplace, whether it's someone who's successful that you can look up to that you think you might ask the tough questions and model after, or whether it's someone who's a peer, someone who's more junior than you, who, you know, we always uh, sort of scoff all oh, the millennials, but they have a lot to teach us in terms of balance and lifestyle and priorities and, and, and productivity. So I think that it isn't always that you go alone until you have to step away, that there are a lot of interim steps. And by the way, part of what I do with people is sort of a career checkup that helps them assess whether they've got the right environment, they've got the right boss, they're handling themselves in the best way, they're giving more than they should, they're not understanding their value, or it's time to think about changing their work place, whether it's sector, size of workplace, type of practice, or the habits that they would bring if they were allowed to forge a new persona in a new place and the habits they would leave behind. So just bring this back to creativity a bit, right? Sure. You know, we see some of these things, like I said, uh, tech companies have obviously changed, right? They're reminiscent of, of like post-college college campuses, right? <laughs> Financial services is picking up on a lot of these cues. What does the disrupted creative law firm of the future look like? In your view, how would you sum up where these firms should be going? Well, we've been talking a long time in the profession about doing away with the billable hour or minimizing the reliance on the billable hour by using alternative fee arrangements that have to do with productivity bonuses for lawyers uh, and other ways of defining success to be paid for. That's one of the things. That's a slow conversation that over the years we thought the clients would really um, affect. But honestly, there hasn't been that much change. That's another thing lawyers are not quick to do is change. Um, and so that's one of the things that the, law, the firm of the future might look like is they'd be more diversified in terms of the way lawyers work and the value of their time, and therefore allowing them to realize that being in the chair, FaceTime, every billable moment isn't necessarily the value for every lawyer on every occasion, on every matter or every case. That's one thing. Um, because we have to have confidentiality in our work, I don't see us having these open workspaces, though I think they're wonderful, but I don't see that for lawyers, but maybe a little less focus on who's got the corner and what size, you know, the offices are in disparity so that there's a little more, as I say, inclusiveness and egalitarianism in terms of workspace. So you're not defined by who you're sitting next to or how big 
your office is, even if it's not the corner, right? I think that that's something that lawyers could learn to let go of that would take away some of the stresses uh, in terms of being on the uh, sort of achievement wheel continually. Um, and while I think it's important to think about wellness in the context of these sort of perks that you can give your people, I, I certainly wouldn't make assumptions if I were running the law firm in the future about what those would be. I think I, I, I'd be more open to conversation with people and have create a culture where if I asked a question about what would really help them in their in the environment, that they would feel comfortable enough to tell me that I wouldn't be laughing if it was something like in the old days they had people come in to shine shoes because the, you know, then you wouldn't have to go outside to shine your shoes and you'd always have those shiny shoes for the clients. You know, if it was something on the level where lawyers didn't necessarily see it coming or relate to it, that they wouldn't laugh about it, that they, that they would really take an open mind to what might be an appropriate perk that would help people and help their bottom line. And it would make them a workplace that other lawyers would want to work in, which would also be helpful in recruiting and retention and advancement and promotion. Recruitment uh, matters too, because everybody needs lawyers, right? Corporate lawyers, compliance is big business these days. So, Right. It's so hard to predict who's going to be, just as it is in baseball, we watched Moneyball, just as we know when scouts go out to look for the best athlete, they don't know who's going to make it over time or who's going to be a quick success. And same with lawyers. And But one of the reasons we're not so great at hiring is because we're asking the same old, same old questions. We're never asking, how would you be, a, what experience have you had that has spoken to the value of inclusivity in your workplace? And how would you bring something to us that we might not have here? So look, we don't ask that. We ask, where'd you go to law school? What was your GPA? Uh, why'd you leave your prior job? Um, we're not very inventive or creative in our hiring. And I think that's another area where lawyers could learn a lot and do a lot more and better. It's kind of a mosaic, Steve. It, it, it all, in the end, kind of feeds back together with the idea of value, ideas, creativity, and openness. You're absolutely right. It's, it's creativity and in the way people lead, in what they value, in the, the culture of the companies, the way they're set up, and even recruiting. So That's right. So all around, it seems like there's this progress to be made in this industry in terms of uh, creativity and inclusiveness and, and just not burning people out. That's right. Not devaluing people or valuing people for the things that aren't necessarily going to add to the long-term success of the individual or the organization. Great, great. That's an optimistic note to end on. Um, Kathy, where can people learn more about you or Under Advisement? My website is www.underadvisement.com. They can certainly go to that and find out about me. I also am the featured career counselor for the Chicago Bar Association, and I have started and run a series of programs in professional development, and we call that the Chicago Bar Association Career Advancement Program. And the website for that, which also has my bio and shows you what we've done, is www.chicagobar.org slash CAP, which stands for Career Advancement Program. I think those are the two easiest ways to learn more about under advisement and what I have done in diversifying over the years the things that I think really matter to our lawyers in the profession and to our leaders. Kathy, great chat today. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, talk with me. My pleasure, Steve. If you'd like more content on company culture, I challenge leaders to create their most powerful values. Often they push back with something like this. We're all about honesty, integrity, and loyalty. They wait for me to be impressed. I kind of want to puke on their shoes. The automatic urge to vomit comes from the fact that the values presented are done so with a supreme pride that the company actually took time and effort to develop these. And what they developed is plain instant oatmeal. Check out episode 26, where John Hitler of Evoking Genius answers a very important question, 
are your core values like plain instant oatmeal. That's all we have for today. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. This has been Inside Forbes Councils. Please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're a member of the Forbes Councils and would like to participate in our podcast series, please email your member concierge. If you're interested in joining a Forbes Council, learn more at ForbesCouncils.com.